Well, good afternoon, everyone. And uh, thanks, Quentin, for that very kind introduction and for inviting us to share some of the work that we've been doing in Chicago to prevent violent crime, um, violent crime involvement among youth, and, um, and measure our results. I, I'm going to just tell you, I looked through the agenda for the next two days, and what I saw was it's filled with really, really smart people who are going to be talking over the next day and a half about really exciting research that they're doing. I'm imagining beautiful PowerPoint presentations and gorgeous graphics. And, um, and I was thinking to myself that I should probably just come clean and say I am not one of those people. My job today is really to set the context. I did bring one. Um, Sarah Heller is with me, and we're going we're gonna to do a joint presentation. My job is going to be to set a little bit of the context, the how and the why we came to start working together with researchers at the city of Chicago on this issue of youth violence. And then I, um, I'm going to invite Dr. Heller up to tell you about the specific program and what we learned from it. And then I'm going to come back and tell you what happened as a result of Dr. Heller's study being published. So, um, so I am here as the former head of a government agency that was responsible for administering the city of Chicago's youth programs. Those are after school and summer job programs. And in that capacity, I served as the mayor's point person on youth violence prevention programs. I co-designed with Dr. Heller the summer jobs program that we're going to be talking to you about today. And through that experience, I became one of the city's biggest champions of a rigorous evaluation to inform public spending on social programs. Then over a year ago, I left the city to become the president of a global anti-poverty and human rights organization called Heartland Alliance, which annually helps over 400,000 people um, who are marginalized around the world to gain access to economic opportunity and stability. Now, from this position as a practitioner, I remain a big champion of rigorous evaluation, only now it's because I need to inform how my organization is spending precious and scarce resources to achieve the best possible outcomes for our participants. Now, I have worked with Dr. Heller um, since we started working together in 2012. I've now worked with her on a couple of studies, and we are starting work on another one this year. But the reason that we like to talk about the summer job study is because it really is a prime example of how university researchers worked with municipal leaders to both design and then rigorously test uh, a, a government-funded government program that was designed um, to solve a, an urgent social problem. And it is just a really great example of what can happen when that partnership succeeds. So before uh, Dr. Heller comes up to, to tell you about the actual program and the study, I want to start by providing a little bit of context about the violent situation in Chicago um, back in 2012 when we designed the program. So um, I, I need to just adjust this whole, um, this whole thing here for just a second. I'm going to... Um, <clears throat> all right, so... Uh, I, I want to set this context because where we are today, as you can see, um, we just ended the most violent year that Chicago has seen in decades. And you've probably read about this in the, in the news from time to time. Uh, it makes headlines in our local papers um, weekly. Uh, this slide was actually produced a couple of months ago, so uh, what you see there are 728 homicides, and we actually ended the year with 756 homicides. I say that because I need to acknowledge kind of where we are today, but when we designed this study, we were in 2012. So what you'll see in 2012 is that it was a high water mark, and, and at, that, at that time, we hadn't seen um, a murder rate that high in 10 years. And so there was a lot of upset in the city about, um, about the violence. 
that year. And at the beginning of the year, there was a very high profile shooting of a, of a young um, woman named Hydea Pendleton. And that, that shooting, um, that, that homicide, made Chicago's violence national and international news. So there just was this feeling of urgency in 2012 um, that we had to do something, we had to find new solutions. Mayor Emanuel had been in office for not even a full year at that point. Um, and so he and his staff uh, were really eager to, to, you know, to start solving some of the city's um, um, persistent problems. But there was also this sense of urgency because there was this kind of intensity to the violence that we were seeing. It was concentrated in certain communities, high poverty communities, and Chicago has 77 community areas, and roughly 70% of the murders were occurring in 20 of those, which are home to 31% of Chicago's population. So the, so the violence is occurring in, in a very concentrated way um, in these geographic areas, but also disproportionately affecting racial and ethnic minorities. 94% of murder victims and 94% of offenders that year were either black or Hispanic. And it also disproportionately affects youth. 17 to 25 year olds make up only 15% of Chicago's population, but they represent 45% of murder victims and over half of murder offenders. So we're feeling this urgency because of that, um, uh, that intensity. We're feeling the urgency because there are unique features to Chicago's violence that complicate our efforts to address it. So um, a couple examples of those is Chicago has a high, uh, a disproportionately high population of gang members. The Chicago Police Department believes that Chicago has the largest known gang population in the U.S with roughly 100,000 to 150,000 gang members. And Chicago police recover more illegal guns than, than police officers in any other city in the United States. Seven times as many illegal guns per capita as officers recover in New York City, and more than twice as many as those recovered in Los Angeles. So all of this adds up to if you live in a high crime community in Chicago, your daily experience of violence is not unlike the experience of people living in some of the most violent places in the world. Parents fear for the safety of their children every minute of every day, and youth are fearing for their own lives as they go to school, as they avoid school, they're fearing for the lives of their family and their friends. And, and the patterns, the causes, the, um, the enablers of the violence are, are complex. And so they've just been very challenging for our city to keep under control in a sustained way. So that was all coming together and that was the reality that the mayor was attempting to change in 2012 and he made it his top priority. Up to that point, the mayor had also been clear that, um, that he was committed to using data and, and rigorous evaluation to solve the city's most pressing problems. He not only encouraged department heads like me to use evaluation to, to evaluate our programs, but to an unprecedented degree, he made available to researchers at the University of Chicago public school data, law enforcement data, and social program data so that they could help us make more informed decisions. So, to summarize, we had a significant and urgent social problem that was disproportionately affecting minority youth living in poor communities, at high risk for gang involvement, and with extraordinary access to illegal guns. And we had a mayor who was, who was prioritizing solving that problem and opened the door for researchers to help us do it in the smartest and most strategic way possible. So the first opportunity 
that we had, the first big opportunity we had, was to take a look at the $36 million that was coming out of uh, my department's budget for youth after school and summer job programs. I independently had been interested in understanding whether that big spend, $36 million a year, was having an impact on the three things that we knew were affecting um, youth most significantly or where there were the biggest disparities for youth. That's um, graduation or education, violence, and employment outcomes. I wanted to know, is that $36 million just doing anything on any of those three issues? And so um, about the time I was wondering that, researchers from the University of Chicago Crime Lab approached me, um, and I was really easily persuaded um, that I should work with them to, to design an evaluation using our youth programs to test the violence effects, specifically of our summer employment program. Now that summer employment program in Chicago is called One Summer Chicago, and it is a really big program. Um, every year, the city of Chicago invests you know, tens of millions of dollars to subsidize anywhere from 24,000. When I left, I think they're now up to 30,000 jobs for youth each summer. That's for 16 to 24 year olds. It's done almost entirely with public dollars. And so that's Chicago's big summer job program. In 2012, I sat down with the Crime Lab to think about how we could use this program to learn something. You know, what if we carved out just 700 of those 24,000 summer jobs to create an experimental program to test whether summer jobs could reduce violence? And that's just what we did. We called that program One Summer Chicago Plus. And uh, at this time, I'm going to turn it over to Dr. Sarah Heller, who was the principal investigator of the study. And she's going to tell you a little bit more about the program and her research. And then I will be back to tell you what happened after. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thanks, everybody, so much. So um, as you've just sort of heard the setup, this is an amazing situation to walk in as an academic. This is the whole reason I do this work, is that there is a problem that matters, and there is a partner who wants to test rigorously ways to fix that problem. Um, and that's just an incredible opportunity. So when I sort of started talking to them, this is the initial question they had. And you guys probably all have your own versions of this question um, in different domains. But we really wanted to know how can Chicago reduce violence because pictures like this are just too common. Um, and so because we were working with the Department of Family and Support Services, we're thinking about summer jobs and, and youth opportunities. Um, and that makes a lot of sense because you sort of hear in the policy world all the time this idea that nothing stops a bullet like a job. And there's lots of reasons to think that that might be true. Right? Jobs provide income, they provide information to kids on how much school matters in the labor market, uh, they provide connections to employer networks so that it might be easier to get a job in the future. Um, on top of all the sort of skill development, job specific skills, soft skills, um, and even simply the incapacitation effect. If a kid is physically working, he can't physically be standing on the street getting into trouble at the same time. Um, and so there's lots and lots of policy enthusiasm about these programs with the sort of uh, blanket assumption that they're going to help employment, they're going to reduce crime. But you, when you really start thinking about the theory, it's not entirely clear cut. So kids are earning money, but we're not forcing them to spend their new money on pro-social activities, right? They could be dry, buying drugs and alcohol, which are in fact ways to increase crime instead of decrease it. Uh, kids are traveling back and forth to new neighborhoods where there's more things to steal, spending more time with peers who may or may not be friendly. Um, and so it's an empirical question. It's a crucially important empirical question, especially as cities are spending $36 million on programs like this. Um, and at the time when we started this, there was a fair amount of evidence on employment programs for very disconnected youth out of school, out of work, a little older than the kids who tend to be in summer jobs programs, but almost no evidence on summer jobs programs themselves. So that's what we set out to produce. And we developed this program, uh, as you heard, called One Summer Chicago Plus, uh, run by DFSS and a network of nonprofit uh, providers who are actually delivering the services. 
It's an eight-week summer program in the summer of 2012, and at the time it was all government and nonprofit jobs, five hours a day, five days a week, at minimum wage. Everyone gets an adult job mentor, so this was sort of part of the focus on violence prevention, is thinking, let's not just dump kids into a job at McDonald's and see what happens, but let's provide them with someone whose whole job is to help them deal with all their barriers to employment, help them figure out transportation problems, family care needs, uh, anything that may sort of keep them from being a successful employee, including helping them to manage conflicts with supervisors as kids sort of learn for the first time how to be an employee. There's a sort of small package of other services. At the time, there was a one-day job readiness training. Um, uh, the program provided a meal a day. Uh, some kids got transportation passes, especially before the first paycheck, to help them get to and from work. And half of the youth also uh, got some version of a curriculum that was based on cognitive behavioral therapy, or CBT, principles. This was based in part on some other research that we had been doing at the time, suggesting these kinds of programs could actually reduce violence and improve school engagement on their own. And so we thought, let's try to pair it with these programs to see if we can sort of magnify the impact that we were having. And we set up the program with uh, the intent of evaluating it with a lottery. And so there's lots of pieces to this. I'm gonna tell you a little bit of the process uh, of how this happened. So we got a little over 1,600 applications. And one of the first questions is, well, who are we gonna invite to this program? How are we, where are we gonna get these applications from? Because it was really a program focused on violence prevention, we wanted to get youth who were at risk of violence, who may not be the ones who necessarily show up on their own uh, for pro-social activities. So we took a list of schools, we decided to do school-based recruiting, took a list of schools, and the 13 highest schools, Chicago Public Neighborhood Schools, uh, that were at the highest risk of having uh, youth involved in shootings and violence. And we went into the schools and invited anyone enrolled in those schools or planning to enroll the next year to apply. And this was not guaranteed to get the right population because the kids who are at highest risk of violence might not be applying. Uh, not everyone goes to their neighborhood school, so we really weren't sure who we were gonna get applying. We just sort of had some data-informed uh, way to decide on recruitment. And you can see here what happened. This is a map of Chicago colored by your violent crime rates where darker areas are worse violent crimes. If you know Chicago, that uh, color scheme will be familiar to you because it's the south and west side. And each green dot here is an applicant. So you can see just by sort of using a little bit of data to think about which schools to recruit in, we actually did a really good job of targeting youth who are living in extremely violent areas, right? So you can see the bulk of the applicants are in the darker areas. So we found our 1,600 applicants, but we only had funding for 700 program slots. And this sets us up to do a really rigorous evaluation, and I suspect I'm sort of preaching to the choir here, but I'll preach a little bit anyway, uh, which is a lottery in a situation like this where a program is oversubscribed, you never have enough money to serve everyone who you think might benefit. A lottery is a fair way to allocate those slots. So the providers, for all of the sort of difficult things we have to ask them to do in terms of following the random assignment lists, uh, they also get an easier part of their job now because rather than sitting in front of a kid and telling them you didn't get a slot because you weren't good enough, they can say you didn't get a slot because it's just the luck of the draw. And that's a much easier message to deliver. On top of that, we now have a treatment and con control group that we can compare to rigorously estimate the effect of the program. So rather than comparing people who walk through the door with people who don't, which is something we often do when we think about evaluation, uh, where, the pe as you guys all know who run programs, the people who walk through the door are not the same as the people who don't, and so that comparison is not really gonna isolate the effect of the program. We can now track these youth in the administrative data you heard about, um, which to Chicago's immense credit, uh, they just sort of opened their doors to us and sort of sharing all of this administrative data. We're gonna track them in arrest data, in school data, in employment data, and we can estimate the effect of the program itself. So let me build up a little bit of uh, suspense and first just tell you a little bit about the study population. So there are a few numbers, but I'm gonna to try to keep it very small with the numbers. Um, so this is just describing who it is who applied. Uh, and you can see here, kids were almost 17 on average, almost entirely African American, almost entirely poor, free and reduced price lunch is a proxy for household poverty. Pretty high criminal justice uh, involvement, so 20% of the sample had an arrest record, even though they were on average a little under 17. Uh, the school year at this point was 170 days, so kids are missing on average six weeks of school. 
although they still have a 2.3, which in Chicago is not terrible. Um, so there was maybe a little bit of this cream skimming going on where when you open it up to a school, some of the higher achieving students are applying, though still, as you can see, at pretty high risk. Right? This, is not, this is a group that's quite disadvantaged and at risk of a lot of negative outcomes. And so the main result, here it is, we track the kids for 16 months, uh, is that violent crime arrests go down by 43% over 16 months. So if you want to think about the magnitudes here, that's about four fewer violent crime arrests per 100 kids offered the program. That's a huge decline in violent arrests among an adolescent population that not very much has worked for. Now one of your initial questions might be, how much of this was because kids were just physically busy over the summer, and then they just go back to whatever they were doing afterwards? So I'm going to show you something that suggests it's not just incapacitation. So I'm going to show you the effect over time. Imagine for a second what it would look like if it were all summer. You'd see this big drop during the summer, and then it would just flatten out, right? Because it would all be concentrated on the summer. That is not, in fact, what happened. So this is the end of the program. So this part is summer. This is the zero line. So there's a little bit of a drop here, uh, and it's a proportionally big drop. But the effect continues to accrue over the next year. So this is not just a case of all we have to do is keep kids busy. Something about the program they're taking with them and is changing their future behavior. So what do we learn from this? There's a lot more. We don't see any changes in other types of crime. We don't see any changes in schooling outcomes and employment. Uh, but we do see that eight weeks by itself can decrease violence by a lot. And relative to how socially costly violent crime is, it's not very much money. So the administrative cost of the program, including wages, is about $3,000 per kid. Uh, so what I was showing you was the effect of any program. It was all the types of programs pulled together. We also found that the youth who got just the job in a mentor had about the same drop in violence as the youth who also worked a fewer hours but replaced those hours with CBT. And so that suggests that those strategies are a little bit interchangeable, that it seems like what kids are learning from either version of the program is about the same. And that doesn't mean that the sort of idea of CBT doesn't work. We have lots of other evidence that it does. It might mean that the mentors and the employers are teaching those same lessons, teaching kids to slow down and think before they blow up in a customer's face, or teaching them to slow down and think before they blow up at a peer uh, on the street and sort of get themselves an assault charge. So, you saw this after 16 months. It takes a long time to sort of let these things accrue and do the research. Any of you who have worked with academics knows it takes forever and ever. But we were giving the city internal reports as we went along, even though that's terrifying to me as an academic because people are going to make decisions based on results that are not ready yet. Uh, but the decisions have to get made. And so we, we sort of had this ongoing partnership. Uh, and Evelyn will tell you offline about how, how many times I use the word caveat. Uh, but. <laughs> Uh, but there it was, and so she's going to tell you in a second about how it shaped the program and the policy and the sort of policy scene around summer jobs. Um, but I'm going to tell you one thing that happened after we actually published the results, which is at the very end of 2014. Um, so we published them in science, and people care. People really care about ways to reduce violence. So we got all of this national news, the Washington Post, US News and World Reports, uh, New York Magazine, Chicago Magazine, and, and lots of others. And if you think about when the last time you saw something good about youth violence and Chicago in the same headline, it might have been this. But this is a really big deal to the city. It brings, it sort of helps all of the providers who worked so hard to implement this thing in a way that's hard for them. It helps the city who has sort of shared all of this data and gone out on a limb where we might have found this $36 million you're spending is doing nothing. And they open themselves to that risk. And this is at least part of the payoff. And then Evelyn's going to come back up and tell you about the sort of policy payoff as well. So these results are not a small thing um, for governments. And um, I don't think it's cynical to say, I think most people who know who work with elected officials, like it matters that an initiative that they undertake gets visibility. And, um, that was one of the first things that happened was just a lot of visibility for this um, program based on um, Dr. Heller's excellent science and, um, and its publication. So that was the first thing. The second thing was within a month of that study being published in science, the mayor turned around and raised $10 million 
to expand the program. So that we were able to um, expand the program from 700 in that study year to 2,000 uh, youth in 2015, 3,000 youth in 2016, and this coming summer they'll be um, serving 4,000 youth in that program. So just by doing a high quality study that also happened to have good results, we were able to make this program ab available to four times as many young people um, as if we hadn't done that, um, that, uh, that uh, study. And that just never happens. It doesn't happen in social services. And then um, the state of our city budget, the state of our uh, state budget would prohibit that. And so, um, so that just was really huge. We were able to um, get some high visibility and we were able to get some big dollars to expand the program. So all good news. But I think the exciting promise of um, these kinds of um, partnerships with researchers is really around, um, and RCTs in general, is how those results can inform the resource allocation decisions that policymakers make. And so I'm going to tell you a story about what happened. Um, I'm going to tell it on myself, um, kind of what was happening in my head, some decisions that I made, and how my partnership with, the, with, with Dr. Heller really shaped um, uh, some decisions, uh, some later decisions. So remember 2012, there's a lot of urgency. People are feeling like um, we're in a really bad time and um, you know, shootings are happening all the time. It's clear that we are on a trajectory to hit more murders than we had in previous years. It just, it, it, you know, there was, there was an intensity of, in that summer. And we had designed this new program and we had gotten it off the ground and that was all well and good, but just the minute we launched it, I was thinking, you know what? The kids that are in this program are not the kids that are driving the violence. They're not the shooters. And next year, 2013, I wanna offer this program to the youth who are most likely to be driving the violence. The, the youth who are involved in the criminal justice system. So I made that decision based on no data. That was just a feeling that I had that this group wasn't the right group and that there was a group that if we, if, if we could offer an intervention that could work for a more high-risk group than the one we were serving, that we could more directly impact the violence. So in the summer of 2013, we worked again with the crime lab to, um, to set up the program to answer a new research question, which was for whom does the program work best? And we expanded the population to test for effects for in-school youth, the same population we served in 2012, and out-of-school youth, those who were involved in the criminal justice system. So, um, we learned an important lesson. I'm gonna just fast forward. We, we ran the whole program that way. And we, ran an, uh, we learned an important lesson. Those very high risk youth likely needed a bigger push than our summer program could give them. They needed a different program because one summer plus, that model, just we didn't see an effect for them. But we did replicate the, 20, uh, the 2012 results with the in-school group in 2013. So that was something that, 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 um, that we were pleased to see. Um, I was a little disappointed that the program didn't seem to work for that higher risk group. And, um, and, but as a result, we've refocused it now to be all about those, those um, the students who are in youth or in this kind of um, critical margin, that they're still in school, but they're showing signs of risk. So that's how, that's how the story ended up. But this is where I'm going to tell on myself, because I made the decision that in 2013 we were going to serve this higher risk group. And I was so convinced, and this, I mean, this isn't because I'm, I, I was convinced that <laughs> it was going to work. I, I really was, and I was so convinced that without evidence to the contrary, 
I know that I would have made the decision to keep uh, delivering that intervention to that population, that very high-risk population, year over year as long as I was going to be there. I knew that I was going to do that. And what happened was, Dr. Heller over wine, we were at another conference, I don't know, we're always at a conference together, um, or over, over wine, she says, um, you know, I got to tell you, I know you're getting ready to make the 2014 decision about, like, who we're going to serve, and I, the, you know, uh, this is where all the caveats came in. It was early, you know, um, but the, what we were seeing was that it didn't have the effect, and it would be a shame if we, if we did a whole summer for that, per, that population if it doesn't have an effect on them. It would be a shame because what a waste of money, and it would be a shame because we're now, um, I guess, keeping the kids who it could benefit from, uh, who, who it could benefit from the program. And so, um, so Dr. Uh, Heller, with all of her caveats, uh, ended up being right as we looked at the uh, over time. The it just didn't have the effect, and she that 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 research, that partnership, that. Um, trust that we had um, kept me from making a decision that would have been a really bad policy decision. And I think about all of the policymakers out there who are making decisions all the time with the best intentions, right? I just, all I wanted to do is have an impact on the violence, right? So um, I think about all of the policymakers out there making decisions all the time without the benefit of um, of the science, the evidence that says, does this work? Does it not work? For whom? In what contexts? And so, um, so I, I tell that story. Um, we also we also did a 2015 study. My I, my time is out, so I'm not going to um, say much more about that, except that um, whenever I talk about um, RCTs, there's people have feelings about them, especially practitioners. Um, you know, they, they're, um, they're almost always not good feelings initially. And so I find myself um, explaining to them why I think it's really important. And a lot of people are afraid of bad news. They're afraid that if you find out that a program doesn't work, that, that, that's, that that's going to be seen as a bad thing. And I, what I tell them is that I think um, there is no bad news that comes out of a well-designed and well-executed RCT. There is only learning, and there is only the next set of questions. And, um, and so that is how we have approached this, this partnership. How can we, so that's the result, great. How can we increase the impact next time? How can we prolong the impact? How can we hold the impact constant, but decrease the cost? Or hold it constant, and apply it to a different set of youth or apply it in a different context or make it easier to implement. So there's only the next set of questions. And um, in 2015, the next question that we set out to answer about the study was um, whether the mentor really makes a difference. Uh, we had reason to believe, you know, anecdotally, like maybe the mentor makes, makes a difference but some other studies suggested that maybe it didn't, and so in, in summer of 2015, we set out to answer the research question, is the involvement of the mentor, or is it just the job that, it, it, that is enough to, to drive the crime reduction results? And unfortunately, those data are still being analyzed. Maybe you can um, talk to, to Sarah uh, offline, and she might, she might reveal the answer, but... Um, uh, I'll just, I'll, I'll end by um, just summarizing that um, the value, there, there's, so, there's, there's so much value in these partnerships. I think for elected officials, the, the visibility um, that one can get from having a really credible partner and a, incredible evidence uh, being published in prestigious journals, um, the, the new private funding that can come out of um, a good result, uh, the, 
we have since seen a whole um, change in the attitude around in Chicago around RCTs, and we've um, invested a lot more money in doing them and expanding what works. Um, so it feels like we're building a, a culture of learning in our city now around and, and trying to build some evidence around what works. Um, all of these things, but mostly that it helps policymakers just make better decisions um, are all of the reasons that I think these partnerships are really, really important. So I will stop there and look forward to hearing some of your uh, questions later. Thanks.